Welcome, viewers, to this broadcast of God's Word. Today's message is titled, Proof That Jesus Is God. There are those who, to their eternal peril, continue to peddle the lie that Jesus is not God. Yet we know from the Old Testament that Jesus is God. He came to fulfill everything that had been prophesied about him in the Old Testament. Testament. And there is no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. As the word of God tells us in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22. And the blood of the sinner could not save the sinner. The blood of animals could not save us as sinners. And keeping the law of Moses could not save us. For there is no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. As the word of God tells us in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22. And it is given for one to die once and after that judgment. As the word of God tells us in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27. Therefore Jesus came as a sin offering. He took the form of man. He being God took the form of man in order to die for man. To die for us on the cross. Had he come in his form as God it would not have been possible for him to be able to die on the cross. And therefore, he took the form of man, being born as a human being, so that he can die on the cross. The only difference between him and us is that in his conception, man was not involved. Had man been involved, had Joseph been involved, then Jesus would have become like one of us, a descendant of Adam. And therefore, Jesus, being God, he needed to take up the form of man in order to die for us on the cross. And for those who say that he's a prophet, a mere prophet, we know that all the prophets were conceived through the involvement of man. They were all descendants of Adam, and they all sinned in one way or the other. But Jesus was not conceived through the involvement of man, because he is God. He took the form of man, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, he was conceived in the womb of Virgin Mary, so that he could die, he could be born as a human being, and die on the cross to atone for our sins. And as we shall look at the word of God, at what Jesus spoke and said in John chapter 5, verse 31 to 47, Jesus sets forth a case for his divinity and presents evidence to his Jewish listeners of his divine status. And this is what the word of God says this is what jesus said if i bear witness of myself my witness is not true there is another who bears witness of me and i know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true you have sent to john and he has borne witness to the truth yet i do not receive testimony from man but i say these things that you, may be, that you may be saved. He was the burning and shining lamp, and you are willing for a time to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than John's, for the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do, bear witness of me, that the Father has sent me, and the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his form, but you do not have his word abiding in you, because whom he sent, him you do not believe. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive honor from men, but I know you, 
that you do not have the love of God in you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Let us pray. Father Lord, we thank you. Thank you, Father Lord, as you have gathered here, Lord, that we may listen to your word. We pray that you open our minds to understand your word, soften our hearts to respond to your word, transform our will to obey and apply your word, that, Lord, we may get to know the truth of God regarding you, Lord Jesus, that everyone may know that you are God and that you took the form of man so that you may die for us on the cross. And therefore, everyone that believes in you, as you have said in your word in John 3, 16, shall not perish but have everlasting life. We commit ourselves to you. We give you all the glory and we give you all the honor. For it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray and believe. Amen. We see here that Jesus has set forth the case for himself. He has said that he does not testify for himself. He says that there is one who testifies for him. And he has pointed John the Baptist. He has also pointed the miracles, the signs and wonders that he performed also testify of who he is. He has also given God the Father as one who testifies of who Christ is. He has also given the scriptures as another testimony of who he is. For Jesus came to fulfill everything that was written about him in the Old Testament. Not one of them Jesus did not fulfill. So Jesus specifically said that he is God. John chapter 8 verse, verse 56 to 59. This is what Jesus said. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went, went out of the temple. Here Jesus has said that before Abraham was, I am. I am is the name of God. Remember back in Exodus chapter, chapter 3 verse 15, when God was speaking to Moses in the burning bush, and Moses asked God, whom shall I say? to the children of Israel in Egypt has sent me. And God told Moses, tell them, I am has sent you. So I am is the name that is a preserve for God. And Jesus here has told his Jewish listeners that before Abraham was, I am. And that is why they picked up stones and wanted to stone him. For claiming, that, for claiming the same title of God, I am. But as we shall see going forward, Jesus never said anything about him which he was not. Because even the Old Testament, the prophets of old testified, they prophesied of who Jesus would be. He will be the Son of God. He will be God. He is not the Son of God in the way people think that for you to be a son of God, then therefore you're insinuating that God has a wife. No, he's son of God because he's in the same nature of God. So when he says that I am, Jews knew that that I am is the name of God. And therefore that is why to them it was blasphemy. Yet 
had they been keenly reading their scripture, the Old Testament, they would have known that the promised Messiah would be God in the flesh. To his Jewish audience, this statement was far more explicit than if he had simply said, I am God. John chapter 8 verse 54, Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. Here, Jesus is telling them that God the Father glorifies Jesus. If you worship God, but God gives glory to me, nothing could be more blasphemous to the Jews than this statement. Jesus claims that he receives honor and glory from the one who the Jews worshipped. John chapter 8 verse 58, Jesus claims the divine name I am to be his own and nothing could be clearer than that. And it was for that reason that the Jews attempted to stone Jesus for blasphemy. Had they been keen on their scriptures, had they been understanding the Old Testament, they would have known that this promised Messiah was God, was God himself taking the form of man. Because we know God is one, but he is a triune. That is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The three are one. And that is what Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 30, that my Father and I are one. So they are one. Yet, they are three in one. In the same way, we as human beings, we are three in one. We have the body. We have the soul, which is mind, will, and emotions. And we have the spirit, which is the inner man that is created in the image of God. So in the same way we are triune, three in one, God is also triune. He is three in one. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Gospel of John uses a whole string of quotes by Jesus where he evokes the name of I am to describe himself. And this is what Jesus says. I am the bread of life, John chapter 6, verse 35, and verse 41 and 48 and 51. Then he says, I am the light of the world, John chapter 8, verse 12. Then he says, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins, John chapter 8, verse 24. He then says, before Abraham was, I am, John chapter 8, verse 12. 58. He then says, I am the door, John chapter 10, verse 7 to 9. I am the shepherd, John chapter 10, verse 11 to 14. I am the son of God, John chapter 10, verse 36. I am the resurrection and the life, John chapter 11, verse 25. You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. John chapter 13, verse 13. I am the way and the truth and the life. John chapter 14, verse 6. I am the true vine. John chapter 15, verse 1. There we see Jesus sharing the same name of God, I am, with God the Father. And in each of these cases, the I am is speaking of his divinity. And with that phrase, he often connects, connects it to titles that are reserved for God alone. The door, shepherd, resurrection, life, the way, the truth, teacher, and Lord. So Jesus did not hide his identity. He said, he is, I am. And he went ahead to prove that indeed he is God. Jesus teaches that he is superior 
to the angels. The angels are his servants and minister to him. Matthew chapter 4 verse 11 and Mark chapter 1 verse 13 and Luke chapter 4 verse 13. The angels are his army. Matthew chapter 26 verse 53. The angels will accompany him at his second coming and do his will. Matthew chapter 16 verse 27 and chapter 25 verse 31 and Mark chapter 8 verse 38 and Luke chapter 9 verse 36. So Jesus is superior to the angels. And we know that all human beings, the prophets, are all lower than angels. As human beings, we are all lower than angels. But Jesus is superior to the angels. Jesus also appropriates divine actions unto himself, and thus, and thus sets forth an assimilation unto the Lord God. He declares that it was he who sent the prophets and teachers of the law. Jesus declared that it is he who sent the prophets and the teachers of the law in the Old Testament. Matthew chapter 23 verse 34 and Luke chapter 11 verse 49 and 2 Chronicles chapter 24 verse 20 to 21 and 2 Chronicles chapter 36 verse 16. He gives the promise of his assistance and grace. Luke chapter 21 verse 15. He forgives sin. Who else can forgive sins apart from God? But Jesus forgives sin. And he proves that when he forgives sins, sins are forgiven. This power of forgiving sins belongs to God alone. But then we see in Matthew chapter 9 verse 2, we see him healing a man, a man who was brought to him paralyzed and on a bed. And he told him, your sins have been forgiven. Rise up and walk. And the Pharisees and other people who were there, they complained that he has spoken blasphemy. How could he forgive sins? Yet, we know that he actually did forgive the man's sin because by Jesus saying that your sins have been forgiven, that man received his healing. Had his sins not been forgiven, the man would not have received his healing. So, Jesus proved that he is God by forgiving sins and indeed that taking effect before the very eyes of the hearers. So Jesus is who he claimed to be, God. We also see him forgiving sin in Luke chapter 7, verse 48 to 50. He, by his own authority, completes and changes some precepts of the law. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. We know how Jesus interpreted the law in a radical way. He even changed some precepts of the law. The law says you shall not murder. But Jesus goes ahead and says, murder does not begin by you actuating it physically. Murder begins from the heart. By merely hating someone, you have murdered them. By hating them in your heart. So, Jesus only has that authority to change some precepts of the law so that people may know that he is part and parcel of God. And when God gave the law, he gave that law in agreement with Jesus. The two are one in every way and in everything. He declares himself to be Lord of the Sabbath in Matthew chapter 12 verse 8 and Mark chapter 2 verse 28 and Luke chapter 6 verse 5 and John chapter 5 verse 17. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was meant for him. When he says he's the Lord of the Sabbath, he means that 
the Sabbath was meant for him. In what sense was it meant for him? That he is the Lord of the Sabbath. By believing and receiving Jesus as the Lord of your life and personal Savior, you enter Sabbath rest. No more trying to work your way to salvation. No more works of the law to attempt to justify yourself. For the law cannot justify anyone. In Christ Jesus, you enter your Sabbath rest. No more works of the law to be justified by God. You are justified by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. So he, when he says he's the Lord of the Sabbath, indeed, Sabbath pointed at Jesus. That in Jesus, we will enter our Sabbath rest by believing and receiving him as the Lord of our life and personal Savior. And therefore, resting from our labor of trying to keep the law, trying to be justified by the works of the law, so that now we have entered our Sabbath rest, no more works to be justified, but rather by faith in Christ Jesus. We receive our righteousness by faith in him, not by our attempt at keeping the law. So he is the Lord of the Sabbath in whom we have entered our Sabbath rest. So he is the Lord of the Sabbath. And even he went ahead to tell the Jews that his father and himself were working at that very moment when they accused Jesus of working on the Sabbath. He said, my father and I are working. Up to this minute, they are working. Which therefore means that everything that is written in the Old Testament about Jesus, including the Sabbath, including including the Ten Commandments, everything points at Jesus. That in Jesus, we accomplish, we attain to God's righteousness that is in the law, that is in the Ten Commandments. If you have believed and received Jesus as the Lord of your life and personal Savior, you have attained to the measure of God's righteousness that is in Christ Jesus, that is credited to your account the moment you believe and receive Jesus. So he is the Lord of the Sabbath. Like the Heavenly Father, he makes covenant with his followers. Matthew chapter 26, verse 28, and Mark chapter 14, verse 24, and Luke chapter 22, verse 20. Also, Jesus makes divine demands upon his followers. He rebukes some for lack of faith in him. Matthew chapter 8, verse 10 to 12, and Matthew chapter 15, verse 28. He also rewards faith in him. Matthew chapter 8 verse 13 and chapter 9 verse 2 and Matthew chapter 22 verse 29 and Matthew chapter 15 verse 28 and Mark chapter 10 verse 52 and Luke chapter 7 verse 50 and Luke chapter 17 verse 19. He also demands faith in his own person. John chapter 14 verse 1 and John chapter 5 verse 24 and John chapter 6 verse 40 and 47 and John chapter 8 verse 51 and John chapter 11 verse 25. He also teaches that rejection of him and his teachings will be the standard of final judgment. He says his rejection will be the standard for judgment on the last day. That those who reject him they'll be judged on that basis. That is what even the word of God tells us in John 3.16. That for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So the, Jesus is the basis upon which people will be judged. The moment you, receive, you believe and receive Jesus as the Lord of your life and personal Savior, you have in essence received the sacrifice that God has given for your sins. And by rejecting Jesus, you have rejected the sacrifice that God has given for your sins. And therefore you will die with your sins. And you will wake up for judgment. As the word of God says in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27. That it is given for one to die once after that judgment. And Jesus is the basis upon which people will be judged. So he says that he is the standard of final judgment. John chapter 12 verse 48 
and Luke chapter 9, verse 26, and Matthew chapter 11, verse 6. Jesus demands supreme love for him, which surpasses all earthly loves. Matthew chapter 10, verse 37, and Matthew chapter 39. Sorry, Matthew chapter 10, verse 37, and verse 39. And Luke chapter 17, verse 33. We also see that contrary to angels, contrary to prophets, Jesus demands, or Jesus demands and accepts worship. Angels don't accept worship. Prophets are not to be worshipped. They are mere human beings like you and I. They were prophets for as long as they received message from God. But they were human beings not to be worshipped. Angels are servants of God. They are not to be worshipped. But we see Jesus here. He demands and accepts worship. Why? Because he is God. Jesus accepts worship, which is a preserve for God alone. John chapter 9 verse 38 and Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 15 verse 25 and Matthew chapter 8 verse 2 and Matthew chapter 9 verse 18 and Matthew chapter 14 verse 33 and Matthew chapter 28 verse 9 and verse 17. So Jesus is God because only God accepts worship. Not angels, not prophets, but God. And Jesus demands and accepts worship. Jesus teaches that his own death will be an adequate atonement for the forgiveness of the sins of the whole human race. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, and Matthew chapter 26, verse 28. Jesus appropriates to himself the office of judge of the world, which according to the Old Testament, e.g. Psalms 49, verse 1 to 6, God would exercise. Matthew chapter 16, verse 27. His judgment extends, extends to every idle word. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36. And will be final and executed immediately. Matthew chapter 25, verse 46. Jesus is the judge. He will judge both the dead and the living. And that judgment will also entail every idle word people utter. And his judgment will be immediately and final. In John's Gospel, Jesus indicates that he is eternal. Before Abraham was, I am. John chapter 8, verse 58. He has full knowledge of the Father. John chapter 7, verse 29. And John chapter 8, verse 55. And John chapter 10, verse 14. He has equal power and efficacy with the Father. John chapter 5, verse 17. He can forgive sins. John chapter 8, verse 11. He is judge of the world, John chapter 5, verse 22 to 27. He is rightly to be adored, John chapter 5, verse 23. He is the light of the world, John chapter 8, verse 12. He is the way, the truth, and the life, John chapter 14, verse 6. His disciples may and ought to pray to the Father in his name, John chapter 14, verse 13, and John chapter 16, verse 23. His disciples may pray to him, John chapter 14, verse 13, and John chapter 16, verse 23. The solemn confession of the Apostle Thomas, my Lord and my God, is acceptable, and in fact, an act of faith, John chapter 20, verse 28. Remember, Thomas is one of the 12 disciples of Jesus who could not believe when he was told by others that Jesus has resurrected. And he said he could not believe until he sees him physically and until he puts his fingers in the wounds that Jesus was pierced in his hands and his feet. And when Jesus appeared 
when now Matthew was together with the other disciples. He called Matthew because he is God. He knew what Matthew had said. I mean, not Matthew, Thomas. He knew what Thomas had said to the other disciples that he could not believe until he sees Jesus physically. And so Jesus called Thomas. And even today, we said, don't be like a doubting Thomas. And Jesus knew what Thomas had told the other disciples. And therefore he called him and he told him, come. You said you could not believe that I have resurrected until you put your fingers in the wounds that I was pierced in my hands and my feet. Come. And we see Thomas declaring that my Lord and my God. So that is acceptable to adore Jesus, to receive him as your Lord and your God. The word of God tells us in Philippians chapter 2 verse 9 to 11, for God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is God, to the glory of God the Father. So every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Those that have not bowed to the Lordship of Jesus, those that have not acknowledged that he is Lord, I tell you the truth, that a day will come when they will stand before him as Lord and they will be judged for not believing in him as Lord and they will go to hell for that reason and spend eternity in hell. Don't wait until you appear before him on the judgment day. Believe and receive him today as the Lord of your life and personal savior. And you will be saved. And when you will appear before him, you will be ushered into heaven, not to hell with those who have declined to receive him as Lord. Jesus calls himself the son of God. Jesus first reveals himself to be the son of God in the temple. When he remarked to Mary and Joseph that he must be about his father's business in Luke chapter 2 verse 49. So Jesus claims to be both Messiah and son of God in the presence of the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin was the the Jewish court. In Mark chapter 14, verse 62, the Sanhedrin perceived this as, as blasphemous. Jesus tells a story of himself in the parable of the vineyard and the evil tenants, thus confessing himself to be the only son of God. Jesus speaks of being one with the Father. The Father and I are one. John chapter 10, verse 30 and 38. That's what Jesus said. My father and I are one. The Jews responded by accusing him of blasphemy. And we know they did all that because they were not paying attention to the scriptures, to the Old Testament, which ex explicitly declares that the promised Messiah will be God in the flesh as we shall see going forward. And many other passages could be listed which show that the promised Messiah is God. Consider for a moment being a Jew of the first century, deeply rooted in the understanding of monotheism, that is, there is only one God. And hearing this sort of talk and these sorts of claims would you believe or scoff and even shout blasphemy? The Jews failed to confirm with their scripture, to confirm that Christ, Christ's claims were true. They only needed to go back to the Old Testament and check what messianic prophecies say about what nature he would be. And they would see that many prophets, including prophet Isaiah, says in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6, for to us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, 
and his name shall be called a wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. They would have seen all that in the scriptures, as we shall see going forward. So they never bothered to read their scripture with understanding. And that is why they perceived Jesus' claim to be one with God as blasphemy. But consider this too. Jesus did give evidence in abundance as to who he was and that his claims were true. In today's gospel, John chapter 5, verse 31 to 47, that is guiding us today, Jesus makes it clear that there are four things that made the unbelief of some inexcusable. It is a combination of eternal evidence, testimony, and internal testimony that he is who he claimed to be. Let's look at the case Jesus sets forth. This is what Jesus says, that the testimony of John the Baptist testifies of who Christ is. And this is what Jesus said. But there is another who testifies on my behalf. And I know that the testimony he gives on my behalf is true. You sent emissaries to John, and he testified to the truth. I do not accept human testimony, but I say this so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and for a while you were content to rejoice in his light. That is what Jesus says in John chapter 5, verse 32 to 35. John was a revered prophet. Even his enemies admitted his holiness and that he feared no man and sought to flatter no one. John the Baptist was bold. He spoke truthfully of Jesus even when it caused him his followers and his own fame. Scripture says, they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. And this is what G John the Baptist replied. John replied, a man can receive only what is given him from heaven. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom stands and listens for him and overjoyed to hear the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine. It is now complete. He must increase. I must decrease. The one who comes from above is above all. That is what John the Baptist said to his disciples. So, John the Baptist, a revered and respected prophet, testified of who Jesus is. Jesus is God. And Jesus also pointed at the miracles that he himself did as a witness of who he was. For no one else did what Jesus did. This is what G Jesus says in John chapter 5 verse 36. But I have testimony greater than John's, the works that the Father gave me to accomplish. These works that I perform testify on my behalf that the Father has sent me. That's what Jesus said. His own works testifies of who he is. And the scripture records 37 miracles by Jesus, which includes the miraculous multiplication of loaves and fishes, walking on water, raising the dead, healing multitudes from countless illnesses, casting out fierce demons, and calm, calming storms. Of course, the 37 recorded miracles, some which affected multitudes, were only some of the miracles he worked. As St. John notes, there are many more things that Jesus did. If all of them were written down, I suppose that not even the world itself would have space for the books that will be written. John chapter 21, verse 25. So the scripture records 37 miracles, but as John here says, 
Jesus did many things that were not recorded because had they to be recorded all of them, the world would not even have space for the books that will be written about what Jesus did. So the miracles testify of the identity of Christ. And even today, even as we go about as ministers of the gospel, laying hands on the sick and the sick receiving healing in the name of Jesus, that testifies that Jesus is God. For by his name, we don't heal people by the name of prophets. If you dare try to heal someone by the name of the prophet, that man will not receive any healing. But by faith, if you pray for him to receive healing in the name of Jesus, he will receive healing because Jesus is God. Even casting out demons, we don't cast out demons by the name of prophets. Because if we dared attempt to cast demons by the name of prophets, demons would not be cast out. But if we cast them out, I cast them out personally by the name of Jesus, and they are cast out. And the person who was demon-possessed, they are restored and they become normal human beings because Jesus is God. And by his name, demons are cast out. So, Jesus is who he says he is. He is God. So, the miracles testify of his divinity. The third witness that Jesus gave that testifies of his divinity is the testimony of the Father. This is what Jesus says in John chapter 5, verse 37 to 38. Moreover, the Father who sent me has testified on my behalf, but you have never heard his voice nor seen his form, and you do not have his word remaining in you because you do not believe in the one whom he has sent. So the Father testified of Jesus at Jesus' baptism, and this is what the word of God says. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Matthew chapter 3 verse 37. God the Father spoke at the baptism of Jesus saying, This is my son in whom I am well pleased. And there we saw the display of the Trinity. God the Father speaking in heaven. God the Son being baptized on River Jordan. And God the Holy Spirit coming in form of a dove and resting at the shoulder of Jesus. That was the, a classic display of the Trinity, of the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Jesus is also speaking here of the interior graces the Father sends to people so that they may believe. But most people ignore these inner promptings by the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, no one, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will rise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. That's what Jesus said in John chapter 6 verse 44 to 45. This indicates an inner inspiration and assistance the Father provides to people so that they may believe in Jesus. But everyone, when they are convicted by the Holy Spirit, they ignore the conviction. That is the inner inspiration that God gives to people, pointing them to believe and receive Jesus. But people normally ignore such inspirations by the Holy Spirit. So no one will have excuse because the Holy Spirit convicts people and he knows that he has convicted you and you have ignored that conviction. So you need to yield to the conviction of your Holy Spirit and believe and receive Jesus as the Lord of your life and personal Savior for no one will have any excuse that they never perceived the inner conviction by the Holy Spirit pointing them to faith in Jesus. For the Holy Spirit does that. He convicts people and points them to faith, to believe in Jesus. But people ignore those convictions. Therefore, 
they are no without supernatural help and are they are without excuse for their stubbornness to decline to or to decide to ignore the promptings that God the Father gives by the Holy Spirit to every person. So Jesus has pointed the testimony of John the Baptist. He has also pointed at the miracles that he did. He has also pointed at the testimony of the Father is showing who he is, giving out his identity by those testimonies. He's, he has also said the scripture testifies of who he is. And this is what he says in John chapter 5, verse 39 to 40. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. So Jesus is saying the scripture and truly indeed, the Old Testament testifies of who he is, of who the, the nature of the promised Messiah will be, that he will be God. So the scripture testifies of him. So people will have no excuse. The Old Testament Jews will have no excuse. Because the scripture testifies of who the promised Messiah will be, his nature. And those who have picked the cue from the unbelieving Jews and went ahead even to formulate their own religions which are founded on the mantra that Jesus is not God, they will have no excuse on the judgment day. For it is by believing and receiving Jesus as the Lord of your life and personal Savior that you will be saved. It is by declining to believe Jesus as the Lord of your life and personal Savior. As the Lord of your life and personal Savior that will be judged. So therefore, no one will have any excuse. So Jesus has said the scripture itself testifies of who he is. Jesus fulfilled hundreds of scriptures that pointed to his coming. His miracles, his divinity. For example, Messiah will be born of a woman. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. Micah chapter 5 verse 2. Messiah will be born of a virgin and called Emmanuel. That is God with us. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. Messiah will be God. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. Messiah will be rejected by his own people. Psalm 69 verse 8 and Isaiah 53 verse 3. Messiah will be crucified with criminals, Isaiah 53, verse 12. Messiah will resurrect from the dead, Psalms 16, verse 10, and Psalms 49, verse 15. Messiah, Messiah will be a sacrifice for sin of all mankind, Isaiah 53, verse 5 to 12. The list goes on and on. Anyone wishing to look at the evidence cannot honestly deny that he is the promised Messiah and Lord. Just going to the Old Testament alone, looking at the Messianic prophecies, you will be able to see that Jesus never claimed to be who he was not. He claimed to be God, he claimed to be the Son of God, and that is who he was. And it is by believing and receiving him as such, that one is saved. And failure to believe in him, no one will be saved that has declined to believe and receive Jesus as the Lord of their life and personal Savior. The religion that people have engaged in cannot save anyone. Nothing can save man apart from the blood of Jesus that he came to shed on the cross to atone for our sins. For there is no forgiveness of sins by any other means but by the blood of Jesus. So therefore, everyone listening to this message, the honors is upon you to appropriate this message and believe and receive Jesus as the Lord of your life and personal Savior so that your sins are forgiven. So that when you die, you will go to heaven and not to hell. For it is on account of Jesus that people will be judged. For he is the Lamb of God 
who takes away the sins of the world. John chapter 1, verse 29. So in application, Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets. And they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. As Jesus said in John chapter 6 verse 44 to 45. This indicates an inner inspiration and assistance the Father provides to people to believe in Jesus. This is your moment. If you are there and you have never had this message that Jesus is the Savior of the world and in his name there is forgiveness of sins and that forgiveness is to be received by faith in him as John 3.16 tells us and as John chapter 1 verse 12 tells us that to those who believed him, those who received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Jesus does not give you salvation by knowing about him. Jesus saves you by not only knowing about him, but also receiving him as the Lord of your life and personal Savior. So this is your moment to receive him as the Lord of your life and personal Savior. So repeat this prayer after me and he will come into your life and he will be the Lord of your life and personal Savior. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe I'm a sinner and you died for me on the cross. This day, I open the door of my heart. I welcome you to come in, forgive my sins and be the Lord of my life and personal savior and write my name in the book of life. In Jesus' name I pray and believe. Amen. If you have made that prayer, you are now a born again Christian. You have been justified before God. Your sins have been taken away by the blood of Jesus. You now need to look for a Bible-believing church for you need to belong with other believers that you'll be able to grow in your faith in Christ Jesus because every born-again Christian is expected to continue growing in the image of Christ as the Word of God tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 that we beholding the glory of the Lord are being changed into his image from glory to glory for that is the purpose and the plan of God. For every person who comes to Jesus, that they may grow in his image, having believed and received him as the Lord of their life and personal Savior. You also need to invest in a Bible. You need a Bible. The word of God is the food of the spirit. For you to grow spiritually, you need to get nourishment from the word of God. You need to read the word of God and apply it in every area of your life for you to be able to grow spiritually. So you need to invest in a Bible. And you need to start reading the Bible from the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is important for a new believer because it reveals to you who Christ is. And you read the Bible systematically. That is chapter by chapter, book by book. Don't read the Bible randomly. Read the Bible systematically. So from the Gospel of John, you move to the next book, which is the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, you will see how believers in Christ are baptized in the Holy Spirit. So you may also desire to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. You only need to ask Jesus in prayer to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. And he will do that because he has promised that he shall do that. So he says in Matthew chapter 7 verse 7 to 8, Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened. For whoever asks receives, and whoever seeks finds, and whoever knocks it shall be opened. So ask him to baptize you in his Holy Spirit, and he will baptize you in the anointing power of the Holy Spirit, that you will be able to do the things that you will do, that you will see believers in Jesus do in the book of Acts. You will be able to lay hands on the sick, and the sick will receive healing. You will be able to bind and cast out demons in the name of Jesus. So signs and wonders will follow your witness for Christ. So desire to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. He also says in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 that you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So desire, and he goes ahead to say, and you shall be my witnesses 
in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the world. So it is by this empowerment by the Holy Spirit that you will receive the power to be able to witness for Christ. That is to tell others about Jesus, what things Jesus has done for you, and you'll be able to lead them to Christ. For that is the commissioning that Jesus has given to all those that have believed and received him. We have been given the mandate to tell the world about him and to lead the world to him. So, that is what you are expected to do as you continue growing in Christ. And now, as we have come to the end of today's message, may the Lord bless you until we meet again. Amen.